Welcome to Knife Chats. If you like what you see, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share it with friends, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. Thank you. I recently did a video on this Mother of Pearl Choctaw. This is a uh, Steel Warrior, which is a brand of Jim Frost. And um, I said a couple negative things about the thing, and I said a couple positive things about it. And I also pointed out that the only place you're going to get a Choctaw is if you buy um, one from Jim Frost, because he's the only one who makes this pattern, and which is true. Uh, in any case, um, the video was seen as being kind of negative towards Frost, and... Um, to be honest with you, I more or less have a love-hate relationship with Jim Frost. Uh, there's quite a few things about uh, Frost products that uh, I get annoyed by, but there's also quite a few positive things you can say about Jim Frost and his empire of knives. And the, the first thing you can say is uh, Jim Frost has probably done more uh, to get people hooked into collecting knives than any other single person. Uh, Helm and his Cutlery Corner Network has turned more people on to knives and knife collecting than any other single entity out there, uh, bar none. And um, so uh, even people who collect high-end knives may have started off their collecting with some kind of Jim Frost product. And the, the first thing you can say is uh, Jim Frost has probably done more uh, to get people hooked into collecting knives than any other single person. Uh, Helm and his Cutlery Corner Network has turned more people on to knives and knife collecting than any other single entity out there, uh, bar none. And um, so uh, even people who collect high-end knives may have started off their collecting with some kind of Jim Frost product. And you see right on top here is probably the knives that uh, most people think of when they think of Jim Frost. And this is one of those uh, plastic handled uh, little lockback knives. They've got a different uh, name, all sorts of different names. Typically, it's known as an eagle eye or something like that, but it's really just a small uh, folding hunter style knife with plastic handles, and the only metal in it is the rivets and a partial back spring here that locks it up. Um, and I actually bought this one for more than I should have paid for it because these knives go for 50 cents to a dollar. Uh, I bought a couple of them, I think. I, I think I actually bought two for a dollar, something like that. But then there was shipping involved also, so I probably paid about three or four dollars for two of these things. But the thing is, is uh, if you check out my channel, uh, you'll see a video where I actually took and pounded on the spine of this knife through a one by two piece of, uh, of plywood. I'm sorry, of, uh, of pine wood. A one by two pine wood uh, beam uh, with a hammer and as you see it's still tight I mean it's got its wobble that's the same wobble it had when it first was made but the lock is very much strong and uh, you know let's face it it's a one dollar knife what do you expect it's just a one dollar knife uh, and these are knives that people buy all the time and are actually quite happy with it for collectors, not so much, but for other people, all they really need is a $1 knife that's going to cut something. And yeah, 420 steel, so you're going to be sharpening it all the time, but for some people, that's really all they want. But you see here a bunch of other knives by Jim Frost, and some of these are really quite great for the price that you're going to pay for them. I'm going to start all the way back here in the back. This is just a little bird and trout knife. Uh, I did not actually buy this knife. came with a nylon sheath. Someone actually sent it to me because I was complaining about Jim Frost knives. And uh, this is a 
five, six years ago, uh, a fellow sent these to me, sent me about 12 Jim Frost knives and goes, you're always complaining about Steel Warrior. Um, but um, here's some Steel Warriors I'd like you to take a look at and actually, you know, give me your honest opinion of them. And, you know, I didn't pay for them or anything, uh, but I do know what they cost at the time. And this little uh, knife with this nylon sheath, which is actually fairly well constructed and pretty stiff. It is just nylon. There is not one of those plastic uh, uh, sheaths uh, inside there that you know you know that you are so familiar with. No, it's just nylon, but it is very stiff, and uh, it's got a nice snap on it and everything else. And this has some really wonderful green bone handles going on, and uh, fits the hand real well. 440A stainless steel. And uh, it's really just a nice little cutter. And uh, the, the build quality is really quite nice. Yes, there's a little bit of a gap there. But um, you're talking about a knife that when it came out cost $12. Tell me that's not worth $12. See there, 440 stainless. So 440A stainless steel. There's the uh, little thing there for the Rockwell testing. So it's 5658 in the HRC. Uh, nickel silver bolsters, nicely pinned on handle, and that's very smooth. And uh, it really doesn't look bad, you know? And really, a $12 knife in that good of a shape, it's it's really a solid, well-made knife. You got a nice um, swell for the palm of your hand. You got a nice groove there. It fits nicely. And you got a good functional blade that um, is, uh, it's, the blade is under three inches long. Uh, the cutting edge on the blade is right at two and a half inches. So this might actually be legal carry in most places simply because of the size, as long as you're allowed to carry a fixed blade. And the sheath is not bad, and it's large enough to actually fit over a fairly wide belt too. So... I'm telling you, it's a really good knife. Steel Warrior. You know, so yeah, there are some really good uh, frost knives out there. Now, one of the things I do not like about a lot of frost knives is uh, the jigging pattern that he tends to use. For instance, here's an Okoye River fish knife. And you see the, uh, that, I don't know what they call it. It's like a stitch pattern or something like that. I really don't like that jigging pattern. Um, I bought the knife, though, because uh, I had heard about them, and uh, I decided to try them out and everything. Everything else about the knife is great. I I think the blue bone came out really well on this. I've also got it in a red bone. Uh, both of them, the coloring on the knife is really nice. I like the way they blended it and everything. I'm just not crazy about the jigging, so... Uh, if it wasn't a fish knife, I would have never bought this. So that's one of the things that uh, I look at, you know. A lot of his jigging patterns I just don't like. However, there's one jigging pattern that he used that I really do like. And that's the uh, crocodile bone. This is the uh, Congress in the green crocodile bone. A lot of people don't like the green uh, bone crocodile, but I like the green as well as the brown. The brown looks a little bit better, but the green... If you're a person who likes green, uh, then you'll probably like this too. And you notice the uh, the way it's done. It, I don't think it really looks like a crocodile or anything, but they call it crocodile bone. And I do like that pattern. And uh, they make a decent enough Congress. I mean, the action is good. The blades are tight enough. There's a little bit of a wobble there. But if you notice here, you've got the, uh, the sheep foot on this side, on the other side, they have a, uh, a drop point or a spear blade, and then you have the uh, pin blade. Notice it's got a half stop. All of the blades have a half stop. Uh, and this is a very old Steel Warrior. This one was around 10, uh, 15 years ago, so it's nothing new. So uh, if you're talking about Rough Rider having the half stops, well, Steel Warriors do too. Uh, so it really comes down to the bone material being used. This is the um, the Stockman and the brown crocodile bone. Show you both of them next to each other. 
and the brown admittedly does look better but I like the green too um, so you know I've got the brown uh, crocodile bone stockman I've also got the uh, brown crocodile bone peanut and it's got good action this does not have a half stop depends on the pattern if it's going to have a half stop but blades open easy enough blades are nice and tight nothing to complain about with it uh, but then I have my little toothpick over here the three inch toothpick and this is one of the things that sometimes happens with steel warrior knives if you notice you might not be able to see it much uh, see the uh, handle is loose and uh, this isn't anything uncommon. I, I've had uh, shields fall off of Steel Warrior knives, and I've also had handles fall off and stuff. Um, and I've also had uh, shields fall off of Rough Riders in the past, too. Um, the knives are really designed more to be looked at than, in some cases, than actually used. If you're going to be using these, the harder you use them, the, the more likely they're going to get damaged. Um, and so what I'm going to have to do is obviously uh, take the handle all the way off, uh, re-glue it, and repin it. Uh, and I'll end up doing that eventually. But, you know, that's one of the things that happens with steel warrior knives a little more often than is going to happen to um, like a Rough Rider. And the problem I have with it is steel warriors tend to go for about a buck more than a Rough Rider. And so I expect the quality to be at least the same as a Rough Rider when in fact it is sometimes slightly less than a Rough Rider. Uh, that was uh, my, my comment really about uh, Steel Warriors is uh, when you compare them uh, head to head with a Rough Rider, the Rough Rider tends to be the same quality or slightly better at a lower price. But still, there are things about um, other uh, Jim Frost knives that, you know, you just have to consider, uh, is it worth buying or not? And I, I've shown this one before, and you're not going to find this in a, in a Rough Rider or just about any other line. This is uh, Genuine Stag Handles. you got the uh, Sunburst Bolsters on there, and if you notice, it's a Six Blade Congress or a Lincoln Congress. This one is in the... Uh, Whitetail Cutlery line. Well, now it's in the Hen and Rooster line. Um, but, you know, again with the half stops and really nice blades. In this case, you have the two sheep foots, but notice half stops going on. You got a pin blade here. Got a worn cliff there. You got a little clip blade there. And then finally a coping blade. And we're talking stag handles. This thing cost about 30 bucks when it came out. Uh, really, seriously, a great knife. Even if this shield were to fall off tomorrow, I could glue the shield back on. But this thing is well penned. It's got beautiful brass liners, 440A stainless steel, uh, wonderful nickel silver bolsters. Um, it's it's a fantastic knife and yeah this was something that frost came out with um you know in uh their whitetail cutlery line so can't argue with that knife and this big old red thing this is a, a wonderful sunfish that they came out with and it's nicely pinned wonderful red bone nice thickness going on uh the the fit and finish is on par with anything i have from rough rider uh, you got the ring bolsters, and um, when you open it up, got the wonderful sunfish, one of 500 going on. And you see there that it's frost cutlery going on with it, too. And you got that nice uh, sunfish there. It looks like a bluegill, maybe, or a crappie. Bluegill. And then you um, got the pin blade over here. The blades are definitely stiff, but so are all the other sunfish knives I have. But nicely well made. And if you notice here, let me close this up. People always talk about crap knives out of uh, Pakistan. Well, you've got the, uh, if you notice there, you have the uh, Match Striker uh, Nail Nick on both blades. 
And this is definitely out of Pakistan. You see it there. Look at how nice and shiny it is, too. Uh, it's made in Pakistan, but that blade, a hint of a wobble if you really try real hard. Very strong back springs. Really solid uh, lockup going on. And this was one of 500, and it went for somewhere around $15, $20. Um, yeah, you can almost see where the, uh, yeah, you can kind of see the pivot point there on that one. But really, you know, we're talking a $15 knife with a nice blade edge there and, uh, you know, solid, well-made knife. I don't know what else to say about it. And then, um, we've got two different, uh, Copperheads here from Frost. These are both in the Steel Warrior line, but they both work a slightly differently. So I think, uh, yeah, we'll start with this one up front here. So this is your basic copperhead that they have. Now, most copperheads, um, do I have one here? Yeah, this is my Rough Rider copperhead, and it's definitely a better copperhead. Uh, notice the length also. These are only about three and a quarter, three and a half inches long three and a quarter inches, maybe three and three eighths of an inch long. Uh, what they're going to end up doing though is they're going to have a blade that is legal in more places than what the uh, Rough Rider Copperhead. Now the Rough Rider Copperhead has the typical blades that you find on most Copperheads, which is either your, your long uh, Turkish clip or also just your straight Skinner blade, uh, depending on which way you want to look at it, and then a secondary clip blade. Those are the two blades you usually find on a copperhead. Now, uh, Jim Frost on his uh, smaller copperheads, the ones that are about three and a quarter, three and three eighths of an inch long, uh, they tend to have a pin blade, which is a nice uh, secondary blade in my opinion, and then a, uh, a clip blade in the back. And those are the two blades that he will normally put on his copperheads. And those are the two blades I kind of like the best. I, I like that blade combination on my two blade knives. But he also has another type of copper head that he has, which is, this is his copper lock knife, or a copper head locking knife. And it's got a hidden lock on it. You've got the, and the difference, the way you can tell the difference between them is if the uh, clip blade is in the, is uh, the front blade. When the clip blade opens, it locks and there's no visible way to close it other than uh, you'll eventually find out that you basically push down on the secondary blade and then the main clip blade can close. Now, I thought, well, when you grip the knife, you're going to end up pushing down on that all the time and closing it. But actually, no, you have to actually turn it over and really press down hard on it to get it to close. And... Um, the way you grip a knife and press down or grip the knife, you're not going to be closing the blade by doing that. Um, and the cool thing about this is uh, the secondary blade typically on these are a uh, little Warncliffe blade. Uh, the Warncliffe blade does not lock, but it's got a good enough spring on the back, so it holds it in place. So, And again, this is one of those things that you do not find anywhere else other than in Jim Frost, like the Choctaw. These uh, locking copperheads that he has, that's his and his alone. So, And I like both of those, and in spite of the jigging not being my favorite jigging on this one, this one's not too bad. That's your typical pick bone jigging. But, uh, you know, I can overlook the uh, jigging that I'm not crazy about simply because of uh, the locking mechanism on the knife. But then we come to this one, another one by Okoe River. And this is their uh, their hobo. It's it's like the, uh, the case hobo, except that there's an issue with this particular knife that uh, annoys me a bit. But you see the blades that you have, and that's the problem I have with it right there. You've got your the clip blade that you find on your typical trapper. And then on the back side, you've got a spoon. And then right down the middle, you've got a fork. But the, the problem with this one is um, everything releases by pushing to the back. 
And what should happen is none of these things should release when the fork is closed. But because they're going to the back, they both release because they're not pressing up against uh, the closure on the fork. If they were closed, if, if, so these, the, the middle portion is backwards. What should happen is nothing should come apart as long as the fork is in there. But because they have them sliding to the back instead of the front to come off, um, everything comes up apart, uh, whether the fork is down or not. So it was a design flaw, once again, by, uh, by Jim Frost. You know, a great concept, a great plan, but in order not to copy what Case does, they had the, uh, the blades open the opposite way. So now um, the knife falls apart even when the fork is down, and that's not what's supposed to happen. All of these blades should lock in place, but they don't lock in place. So that's when uh, I get upset with Jim Frost. Uh, a, a minor detail like that can just aggravate me to no end. Um, otherwise, this would be a terrific knife. I, I still have it because um, this is the only one in white smooth bone that you're going to find. Um, unfortunately, there's a major flaw with the knife. And as long as we're talking about uh, white smooth bone, this is uh, my 7-inch stiletto. And again, if you notice, that's Steel Warrior right there. And um, I was looking forever for a white smooth bone stiletto. I was actually preferring to get one that was 5 inches, but I finally found one that was 4 inches that I could afford. Now, I had seen white smooth bone stilettos, um, but most of them were in the $90 to $100 range. Um, this one here... Uh, this this came in at right around 15 bucks, something that uh, I could uh, afford for the collection. I wasn't about to spend uh, $90 for a white smooth bone stiletto if I didn't have to. And quite frankly, this is a really well-made stiletto. Uh, yeah, there's a bit of a gap there, and, a, and you can catch your nail there. But uh, considering uh, what you usually have in a stiletto, that's fairly smooth and the bone is nice and you got wonderful brass uh, bolsters going on and the lockup is excellent. It's just really strong. I, I don't feel like it's going to fail or anything like that. And the blade rocks around the right way and everything else. So, you know, it's just a well-made stiletto. Now, yes, I could find other stilettos in that price range, but I could not find them in white smooth bone. And Rough Rider does not make a traditional stiletto. So really, it was this or nothing, uh, unless I wanted to go to Kissing Crane. But again, no white smooth bone in Kissing Crane. So that is the other thing about uh, uh, Jim Frost and his products. Like Rough Rider, he puts out a tremendous number of patterns and sometimes he makes patterns that you're not going to find in Rough Rider or anywhere else and also adds things to knives that you just don't find anyone else doing and um, the quality sometimes it's so-so but quite often it's right up there with Rough Rider but you're paying a little bit more for it. So if I had to choose, I'm going to choose the Rough Rider over a frost of a similar knife, uh, especially when uh, you start looking at some of the jigging patterns, but some people actually like this jigging pattern, I guess. Uh, but uh, if I can't find it in a Rough Rider, I don't have a problem with picking up a knife from, uh, from Steel Warrior or other Jim Frost lineups. Uh, yes, I know a lot of people cannot stand him simply because of him making all sorts of things in China and Pakistan, but several other companies are doing the same thing. So I, I can't fault him for that. I would love it if he would turn more production into uh, the United States or into Europe. Um, and maybe someday he will if there's enough pressure. But... At the same time, you got to give credit where credit is due. 
If it wasn't for Jim Frost, there's a lot of people who would have probably never picked up on the knife collecting hobby. And because there's more people out there collecting knives, the prices for even the American made knives uh, tend to keep down a little bit because, you know, it really comes down to supply and demand. And uh, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah. I guess I'll, I'll wrap it up now and just sum it up by saying, yes, uh, Frost does uh, produce some knives that are crap, if you want to say that, but it's a $1 knife. What do you expect for $1? He also produces some really high quality knives at a very affordable price when you start looking at something like this in Genuine Stag. And he also makes knives that you're just not going to see anyone else making. So the Choctaw is uh, Jim Frost's uh, version of, I guess you could say it would be, the, the Choctaw is to Jim Frost what the Rustlock is to Case. It's one of a kind. You're only going to find it there. In any case, I'll let you go now, and I hope that explains a little bit more of my feelings towards uh, Jim Frost and his product. Well, I thought it was finished. Um, the uh, blue jigged uh, fish knife by Okoe River, I said I had a red jigged one also. Apparently, I gave that one away. Uh, I recall that now. About a couple years ago, I gave away the red jig bone one, uh, but I still have the one in Oxhorn. Uh, and the reason I kept it is it has a different shield. The red jig had the same shield as the uh, blue jig. And I just wanted one with uh, the different shields. But man, I tell you what, the more I look at it, that ox horn is really pretty. Um, uh, yeah, minor flaws here and there at the, uh, you know, where it meets up with the bolsters and stuff. But really not that bad. A uh, little bit of a gap there. But very pretty, nicely done shield, and just a really nice knife. And also, I was talking about the uh, stag on this, uh, the Six Blade Congress by Whitetail. And, um, and said it was really some of the prettiest stag around. And quite frankly, among my folding knives, the only one I think that has nicer looking stag on it is my Case Junior Scout. I've mentioned that many a times that... Case just does a wonderful job with uh, with their India sandbar stag, uh, and you can see it definitely looks better than the uh, the whitetail cutlery one. But then when you compare that whitetail to this one, I mean, really, I think the whitetail looks a whole lot nicer. And this is Great Eastern cutlery, and I really like the coloring on the uh, the whitetail better than the Great Eastern Cutlery with the stag. And, um, you know, I, I get it. That's the beauty is the is in the eye of the beholder and everything else. But, uh, and this might be a higher quality stag, but uh, the stag on this just looks much nicer. This one uh, is truly a beautiful knife. Thank you for visiting Knife Chats. I hope you enjoyed your time here. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel and ringing that notification bell so that you will be notified when the next episode of Knife Chats is up online. Thanks again. See you soon.